Welcome to the USU Career Studio podcast that helps you navigate your career path. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to tell your friends and family all about it. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to get access to our newest content. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I am so excited to welcome Clark Ripplinger to the show. Welcome, Clark. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. So excited to have you here. So Clark is a licensed psychologist for Utah State University. He earned his PhD in counseling psychology and has been providing services in Utah for a decade. Clark currently supports statewide students with all things related to mental health. So Clark, super excited to have you. Um, I, you know, everybody's dream is to talk to a psychologist, right? For free. (laughs) Everybody's dream or their biggest fear. (laughs) One of the two. Yes. (laughs) Oh, well, I'd actually love to start a conversation today by going back in time just a little bit um, and starting with your fun fact, which is you were a middle school science teacher back in the day. So you have to tell us the story. Walk us through why you did education for a hot second and why you transitioned to counseling. Okay. Well, uh, when I was a college student, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And in fact, I had spent far too long trying to get my bachelor's degree. I had over 200 credits by the time I graduated because I just was so indecisive and was just sitting around enjoying the whole college experience. Wonderful. So one day my dad sat me down and was like, you got to pick something. And in fact, he picked one out for me. (laughs) And I was like, this is going to get you out of school the fastest. So here you go. And it was biology. Because I was possibly looking at pre-med and I was like, maybe I want to do that school thing for forever. Who knows? Uh, Biology. Then I realized I didn't want to do biology. So I made a slight shift and did biology composite teaching, which for me felt kind of flexible. And I could do med school if I wanted to. And I could also go do teaching if I didn't want to do med school for forever, because that was a daunting prospect at the time. Um, and fell in love with teaching. So I had an advisor that I just really connected with and we saw a lot of philosophies in the world in the same way. And like, yeah, we can be there for kids and help them through some difficult transition times. And it was great. So I went and taught. Um, I taught at Churchill Junior High. I taught at Fort Henry Middle School. Um, had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Loved having students, a seventh grade classroom. It was enjoyable. But then um, there was a lot of focus on end of year tests and that the students need to do better on this one thing. If, if anything, if the teacher's job is, is um, teaching, then this test is going to show how well you taught. And uh, it was not my favorite. You didn't buy I was it. there to like, what, sorry? You didn't buy it. <laughs> no, I didn't buy it because I was there. Remember my advisor was like, we're going to help kids through this transition time and it's a hard time of life. And everyone else was like, state test, state test, state tests. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> so it all came to a head when I had one student over the summer who was at home when um, her father took his own life. And she was there to kind of witness it all. And Mm -hmm. so she was dealing with some serious trauma and some mental health issues. And the next year she was in my class and the school counselors came and said, hey, we've got this grief group. And I said, yes, take her if you need like any. I don't mind if she misses my class because that feels more important to me than science. Or do you know how many electrons are in this atom? (laughs) which is important, but not anything like this. And then administrators were like, well, she's not doing as well as she did last year because they were concerned with my teaching because of it. And I was like, this is not a teaching issue. This is mental health. And that's when I realized that the goals of that were put on me to be a teacher were different than the goals I had for myself. So then I shifted and went to the... Um, went to Utah State and did the master's program that they have for school counseling that let me um, just go to school while still working. And I did the school counseling thing, loved it. And I fell in love with it so much that I decided to keep going and got a PhD in counseling psychology. And now I just do therapy. Um, I now do all things mental health. 
and it just is so much it's such a better fit for me and for my goals and for just what I wanted this to look like. That's so interesting, Clark. And I so appreciate you sharing that story um, and all of the vulnerability that comes with that story, because, you know, you, you hit on a lot of things. You said, I didn't know what I wanted to do in college, uh, which is a really common thing that students come to me all the time about. And the, the crazy part is they think they're alone in that. They are the only person on this planet who can't get their crap together. That's what they truly believe. And yeah. so I so appreciate you sharing. Um, and again, your story, along with so many other stories that I've had on this podcast, but elsewhere of folks saying, yeah, I didn't quite know at that moment. <laughs> so I appreciate that number one. Um, and I would also say, um, I also appreciate you talking through the kind of the, the prototyping, we call it that in, in the career design center, but really just testing things out. You know, you built connections and you started to say, well, you know, this work that this person does is kind of interesting. And you built a relationship there. And eventually it kind of turned into a different career path, which is so cool. Um, but I think, again, it speaks to the fact that careers are not linear. Um, they're meant to change. In fact, they have to change. And I think COVID, if nothing else, has proved that things can't always stay the same. And so, again, so many great things we could talk about for probably like 10 years. But I really appreciate um, you sharing that story. And it actually leads me into uh, my next question, um, which you've touched on a little bit here. But I am curious um, lots of folks love the idea of helping people and psychology is one of the thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of ways that people can help people in a job. But I'd love to hear from your perspective. What are some of the best parts of this job and like, be real with us also. What are some of the worst parts? Ooh, this is a tough question. And honestly, this changes from day to day sometimes, <laughs> Fair. <laughs> But more often than not, I find that my favorite part of the job really is just sitting and talking with the people that come in and say, help, I want to talk about this. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. And it's, it's just a powerful thing to be in that space where someone trusts you enough with something they don't trust a whole lot of people. And just, they come in often feeling kind of insecure and not sure and just a lot of questions and a lot of concerns and worries and I don't know and what about and it's so great for to be the trusted person that they can just sit and explore that space to 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 provide them with something that's different than they have anywhere else in the in the world where they're typically like judged or everyone else is going to have their own opinion of what you should do and here I come in and I just get to be warm and accepting and say this is a tough decision. How, what are you thinking? Like, what do you want to do? What are other people saying you should do? What do you feel about that? You know, just to give them a space that is truly theirs. You know, I feel like that's kind of rare. Everything else kind of has its own influences on you and your choices. But in here in therapy, it's all you. And I love that. Oh, yes. Um, hardest part. Um, this is, I don't know, this shifts from day to day. More often than not, um, I don't experience this a lot right now being part of the statewide program, which I love. That's one reason why I love this job. Uh, but more often than not, I find that there is a high demand for me as a resource, if I consider myself a resource, yes. and people want to access this. And as students, or even just people in general, you know, like if I were in the community just doing private practice, that alone also has a high demand, there's high wait lists, there's also a lot of costs that can be associated with it that makes it difficult for like a barrier for people to get in. Um, and so just at the university, we also, we don't have a cost here, luckily, which I'm grateful for. Which is but. wild. I just want to point that out how wild that is, truly. <laughs> it really, it's, it's such a great, great thing that I love that the university does. But at the same time, the university is like, well, we need to make the most of this resource. And so often there's a lot of high demands on me to give more and more of my time. And I have to be a little bit boundaried often and say, you know, that's, too much, you know, like mm -hmm. seeing 30 students a week is not a logical thing and not something. Well, it may seem logical on paper, like here's your job. So let's do it to the best that you can. And we'll get as many people through your door as we can possibly do. 
that I defined at that level, I am not a good therapist. Yes. I get tired. Yeah. I get burnt out. I forget people and their names and their stories, which I looked at at some point. I was like, I don't want to be this kind of a therapist. I didn't get into this for the money behind it. I didn't get into this for social status. I don't whatever. I didn't get into it for any other reason other than to be here for people. And sometimes being here for too many people doesn't let me be here for people. So yeah, it's just navigating my own needs in balance with everyone else's. So. And how cool is it that you are practicing what you preach by doing that, <laughs> by setting your own boundaries and saying, you know what? I actually need, I need that time. I love that. I think that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good point. <laughs> I forget about that. Often, yeah. Uh, to do man, so interesting. Okay. I want to move into talking, maybe kind of zooming out a little bit on this question. As you mm-hmm. look at the pandemic, especially, but even just the last couple of years, I'm curious, have you seen any changes in, in the counseling realm or, or have you seen any I don't know, mental health trends that you find interesting? I guess I'm just kind of opening that question up to what is intriguing you about the field right now, Clark? <laughs> <laughs> um, I get this question a lot because I feel like that people have this awareness that mental health is really being taxed right now by the whole pandemic and everything and everything that comes along with it, which I personally believe and feel myself but I'm also hesitant to kind of say like, this is the thing, because I haven't jumped into the research, which I am a big proponent of actually doing research instead of saying, this is what it feels like. So this has to be true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, right. Isn't that kind of <laughs> somewhat counterculture sometimes? But yeah, so I have done some research, mainly because you have a career fair thing coming up. And I was like, I want to look into Uh, kind of the most current research around the stress around finding jobs, which is a huge thing with the pandemic. (sighs) And just the current financial state of of our country. And it's tough. It's tough to, to navigate this unemployment, to navigate going so long without a job or having a job be threatened, to have to, to navigate these changes that COVID is demanding of all of us. So just that aspect of COVID alone has had so many mental health issues and, 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 and demands that have been hard to navigate. So that alone, as far as the research that I've seen, majorly an issue. But then there's beyond that, just even like the, the threat of, the, the, of your health, the threat of the people of those around you, you know, like the social isolation of it all. Like all these things I imagine are definitely having an impact on mental health. I just haven't seen it in the research, so. No, those are great insights. And I appreciate you following the research. We all should do that more often. (laughs) Right, I'm trying to be better about that. I, um, this is probably totally not even related to your interview, but let's just go with it anyway. Like that's a thing that I am noticing in myself. Like I have my Facebook and my Instagram. I have a lot of people saying, here's my story. Here's a story, here's something. And uh, kind of just with the whole theme that showed up, even with the, the the presidency of fake news, you know, I'm like, so what is real news? So I wanted to like jump in for myself instead of just believe what people are telling me or what I'm seeing on my Facebook feed, which who knows how biased that is. I don't want to be an echo chamber of my own thoughts. So I want to go in and get in the research and see it for myself. Amen. I, it's so funny you say that. So I'm in my master's program right now and I'm currently taking a research course and, you know, I am sitting back and I'm just thinking, man, everybody should take this course. Everybody should know how to identify uh, research that is not only just research, but it is backed. And, and it has, you know, other people have said, yes, like this matches our data. Like <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but it is, it is amazing. Uh, and it's so easy with um, the accessibility of the internet and social media for sure plays a role in this. Um, yeah, the interesting topic. Again, we could probably talk about this for another 100 years. And we unfortunately, totally <laughs> we don't have time today. <laughs> oh, But I appreciate you bringing that up. It's such an important piece. Um, okay, so we're talking about psychology. I'd love to ask you, um, if I was a student and I said, Clark, like, what are some of the skills you bring to the table as a psychologist? that really help you do the work or or make you a good psychologist? Like what are some of those skills you bring? 
one thing that I say is essential and something that I am constantly trying to, to hone in myself and, and grow in this area is just um, knowing yourself and insight into like how you see the world, what are your biases, um, do you have prejudices? And if and you do, but what are they? What are your prejudices? How do they show up? How does your how does your behavior and your choices and your demeanor and your way of being in the world impact other people? Power dynamics. So there's a lot there that I actually didn't even fully understand until getting into my PhD, even after the master's degree. Like there was a certain level of it in my master's degree that was like. <clears throat> using myself as a tool in a sense. I'm like, here I am. I'm going to learn how to uh, listen and reflect with empathy. You know, like that was a skill I needed to learn. But I didn't fully understand that even that can be um, altered or manipulated or changed by just how I see the world, how I believe people exist in the world and what I what I see and how I see it. Does that make any sense? Sort of yeah. Sense? Well, and it makes me think about like intersectionality, right? You have all yes. of these different identities and that's okay, but also recognizing those identities will impact the way that you interact with others. Super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because people come to me and they talk to me about their world. And so I get a, the, the this opportunity to kind of put myself somewhat aside and kind of jump in with them but there's no way that I can really do that unless I know what biases I'm really going to be bringing with me. Like, ideally, I would love to just leave myself to the side and say, I'm going to jump in with my client, but that's not real. I bring myself with me as I jump in. And so I often am in sitting with a client and I say, you know, this is my bias that I'm seeing it this way. Tell me if that's right or wrong. You know, like, how are you mm -hmm. seeing it compared to what I'm seeing through your eyes? and help me just kind of better understand your world. So it's it's a powerful thing to really fully understand your biases and your impact. So, so interesting, Clark. Um, I'd love to chat, again, thinking from a student perspective, um, let's say a student comes to you and says, Clark, I think I might want to be a psychologist, and I am currently an undergraduate junior student, um, and maybe they haven't gotten a lot of firsthand experience of what that one-on-one -on -one scenario actually looks like. Um, I'm curious from your perspective and, and maybe just like ideas that you have, how could a student maybe, again, I use the word prototype, but really just test out, like how, how do they know if they're going to like that situation of all of this heavy stuff is being, you know, given to them? Like how could a student like prototype this out? Do you think? That's a really good question. Um, I feel like there's a couple of ways to go about it. One being, well, first off and foremost, don't try to do it without training. <laughs> yes. So a lot of people are like, I'm going to be the therapist for my friends. I'm like, no, you can give them advice. You can listen to them with empathy, but your role in that setting is not to be the therapist. That's a very different role. Uh, I would talk with people that are therapists or psychologists or in the mental health field to kind of just um, understand more about what they're seeing to see how it aligns with, with you and see how you relate to it. I would also, um, cause the therapy experience, it's hard to get like a feel for, cause you can't really just sit in on it unless you're in training and have like forms signed that says my client gives permission for this person to sit in on the training. It's complicated, but there's a lot of rules around it. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do have therapy sessions that you can look up online. So some of my training involved when we were being exposed to different theories or ways of doing therapy was to kind of just see some examples of how that therapy was being done. And I think that's a great resource, you know, Interesting. Like, watch a therapy session. There's um, a lot of podcasts out there that um, are therapy sessions too. I'm trying to remember the name of one that I love right now. And I can't think of it off the top of my head, but she does couples therapy and you get to just sit in and listen and, see how she responds, see what they say. And then in a way you can kind of get a feel for like what it's like to be in that room and what kinds of issues people are bringing to the therapy space, you know? Yeah. Cause it's going to be a difficult thing to see if you can kind of just let that go when you go home to be in that spot of feeling somewhat responsible for the whole situation. It's sometimes difficult for people to, 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 
leave work at work, you know, and then just go home and live their life without worrying about their clients or wondering or thinking, are they going to be okay? Should I have done this different? Like, I hope they think, you know, it's difficult to have some good boundaries around that too. So maybe just even jump into advocacy to kind of see like how that works for you. And can you leave advocacy work at home while you go and live your life? That's Those are doing. some great suggestions. And I love that you brought up the, the privacy element of this and also the, uh, don't be a therapist before you actually are <laughs> licensed to be a therapist. Um, and it's interesting because oftentimes when I chat with students, I do encourage them, you know, to try things out on a small scale. You know, for example, if you think you want to open your own bakery, like, well, you better do some practice baking and make sure you actually enjoy that. Or, you know, if you're doing the management side, actually, but in this case, you do bring up a really good point that, uh, there are some limitations with the types of prototypes we're going to want to run for, for this for this job. And so I really appreciate you bringing those up. But I do yeah. love the idea of the podcast and listening in and kind of being being able to listen in there. And um, yeah, lots of good thoughts. So I really appreciate all of those. Um, Clark, I'm looking at the clock. I can't believe we've almost been talking for a half an hour. Truly, that blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we need a longer version of your podcast part two okay maybe we'll have to <laughs> part two or the extended stuff like lord of the rings yes yes <laughs> director's cut oh yes well clark i do want to ask one final question today um and that question is if you could go back in time maybe to like 18 year old clark what kinds of advice maybe life or, or career if you want to get more specific what kind of advice would you give yourself? That's a good question. And this is totally, again, from the lens of my biases, because I am the person that I am. And I kind of love the way I did college as far as like, take my time and enjoy the whole process. <laughs> and my advice for my 18 year old self, honestly, this is so funny to do a little bit more of that. Because the one thing that I didn't get to do that I keep looking back at and I think that would have been so great is to do like a study abroad, you know? Like just take a semester and just take the risk and just go, you know? Like it's not, I thought it was like for specific majors. I'm like, I can only go to the New Zealand experience if I am like a rec therapist and I wasn't that. So, but you don't have to be a specific major to go. You can just go do a semester in Spain and do your humanities class there, you know, like, yeah, I would love to do study abroad and I feel bad that I never did. You should find a way to do it. Start prototyping. How can you make that happen, Clark? <laughs> How can I make that happen? Well, I'm not in school anymore. <laughs> and if I went back for another degree, my friends would just be like, intervention, what are you doing? Why are you? Like, I didn't choose pre-med for a reason because I didn't want to be in school for forever. And then here I am with mm, like 14, 15 years of higher education under my belt. I'm like, I should have, could have just gone for it, but who knows? You, you never know. <laughs> oh man. Well, Clark, <laughs> I seriously, every time I chat with you, I just, I feel, what do I feel? I feel. What do you feel? <laughs> more. Oh boy. We're getting into a therapy <laughs> session. You're welcome audience. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I truly feel, I, I feel heard. I think that's the word I'm looking for, which makes perfect sense given your profession, but I really do appreciate um, the thought and the care and the listening that you bring to discussions. And uh, even today, I've just appreciated, you know, again, like the vulnerability that you've shared with us, our little group here, you've, you've really given us some good insights and, and let us know that it can be messy. Messy is okay. Actually, messy is great. <laughs> so, messy is great. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm glad you feel seen and heard. Like I, I'm surprised that you feel that way if, since I was kind of talking about me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's been your experience. Oh, well, thanks so much, Clark. And we'll, we'll talk to you later. Sounds good. Thanks, Marissa. We hope you loved this episode of the USU Career Studio podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and share this episode with your friends and family. 